Dr. Tariq has helped get things together here. And uh, today we're going to talk about left bundle bridge block and coronary artery disease. And so uh, I thought I would put down some like axioms and see what you thought about that and then we'll move on and see if we can apply them a little bit. Dr. Tariq was asking yesterday about a patient and he said, what are the rules? And I said, there aren't any rules. And he said, we got to know the rules because you're going to have a test and you take a test and you got to know what the rules are. And so I think you get to a point where there aren't any rules. And he said, what was the rule about when do you stop the amiodarone when someone has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? And basically it's a clinical judgment based on an individual patient. So let's talk about what could be rules here, and so, and then what rules might be broken. So left bundle branch block is not commonly caused by coronary artery disease. Pooh, is that a rule, do you think? No, I mean, CAD is one of the important causes. There can be other reasons, but CAD is definitely in there. Okay, well, we'll talk about that at the, at the end of our, our talk and see if you have any revisions to your thoughts. Left bundle branch block is used in incidental finding. Well, if you think it's caused by coronary artery disease, it couldn't be then an incidental finding. Left bundle branch block is mostly caused by fibrosis, sclerosis, or calcification of the left bundle or the bundle of his, giving you a complete heart block. Left anterior fascicular block receives the left anterior fascicle receives its perfusion by a septal perforator from the LAD. The same as the right bundle. So that's the right bundle branch, that is. So we'll see, as you know, the left bundle divides into the left anterior fascic fascicle and the left posterior fascicle. So you have left anterior fascicular block and left posterior fascicular block. The division of the left bundle was rediscovered by Dr. Mauricio Rosenbaum in about uh, the 1960s. Basically, he rediscovered it from the German literature, and then he dissected it. He was in Argentina. He was one of my teachers. He taught me how to read EKGs. He wrote a book called Les Hemiblockies, which obviously was not written in English, but it was published here in Tampa, as a matter of fact. The left posterior fascicle receives its perfusion from the AV nodal branch from the right bundle if it's a dominant right from the right coronary or from the circumflex if it's a dominant left. And so that's interesting. So if you were going to try to get a left bundle from an infarct, you would have to have an anterior wall infarct that would knock out the left anterior fascicle from the LAD and you'd have to have an inferior wall infarct or an inferior lateral to knock out this uh, AV nodal branch area from the right coronary of the circumflex depending upon if it's a dominant circumflex circulation or a dominant right. So it's pretty hard to get a left bundle branch block from acute MI unless you have two acute MIs at one time. The largest infarctions are associated with the LAD obviously where you get anterior wall, septal, and apical MIs, a big MI. That's associated with right bundle branch block because the right bundle is supplied by the septal perforators and sometimes the left anterior fascicular block, but not with left bundle branch block because you haven't knocked out the left posterior fascicle. Interesting. Septal ablation for patients with hokum produces right bundle branch block, never produces left bundle branch block, and of 100 cases, 75% of them will have right bundle branch block. Hmm. I guess including an LAD is not going to cause left bundle branch block. Left bundle branch block and acute MR are mutually exclusive by software programming. Well, that's interesting. So if you have a left bundle, the computer programmed for GE, that is MUSE, by Dr. Peter McFarlane in Glasgow, 
is not going to be able to read simultaneous left bundle and acute MI. So if someone comes in the hospital with a left bundle and acute inferior wall MI and has big ST segment elevation in 2, 3, and F with reciprocal changes in 1 and L, unfortunately, the computer is going to overlook that because it's been programmed to read left bundle branch block exclusively. And so basically a patient gets admitted with inferior wall MI, undiagnosed by a computer, goes to the floor, gets in trouble, massive lawsuit because you can look at the EKG and see there's an acute inferior wall MI. Anybody could read it across the room. Unfortunately, the computer is not programmed to do that. And so there's a million dollar lawsuit for sure. And I can show you the EKGs. So let's look at the blood supply of the coronaries. And also let's look at the conduction system. This is stuff that you can find online. And uh, you can see here's the right coronary. There's the PDA. There's the AV node. And there's the AV nodal branch. So it does have the AV nodal branch here supplying the AV node. It also is having it supply the right bundle, which is wrong. It has it supplying the, the, before the, the pre-divisional uh, conduction, uh, basically, of left and right while they're joined. And so this has totally got it wrong, and so we can't follow that. And then here's the posterior division and the anterior division of the left bundle, and it has it pretty close to being supplied. It really doesn't say where it's being supplied here. And so let's go over the next one on the right-hand side. Here's the LED. Here's the right bundle. Okay, that gets it right. Here's the anterior fascicle. That's pretty close, too. So you can get the right bundle, the septal perforators. You can get the anterior fascicle. And then here's the posterior fascicle supplied from the right coronary. And here's the AV nodal branch coming off. So this is pretty close to being what really is the way it happens. We can go down here, and here's AV nodal, supplied by an AV nodal branch. And then if we look over here, we've got the right bundle coming down here, and it seems to be closest to, even though it's supplied by septal perforators, it is pretty close to the posterior descending. Looks like it's being supplied by septal perforators, and so that takes care of that. But then here's the anterior and posterior divisions. Both look like they're being supplied here by the LAD, and that's not right. So let's go back over to the last one over here. And we've got the right coronary, we've got the right bundle, we've got the AV nodal branch. So we've got AV nodal branch coming up here, supplying that. We've got uh, the right bundle here that should be supplied by the septal perforators. Looks like it is from the LED. And then we get the anterior fascicle and the posterior fascicle. There's the posterior division. Posterior division supplied by the right coronary artery, anterior division supplied by the LAD. So this is anatomically correct. And so you can see that you can't really count on what you see in the literature. All this stuff that's published online doesn't seem to quite get it. Let's go to our Sherlock Holmes mystery case one. Melody, I'm un, uh, unmuting you, Melody. Welcome to the conference. And so we're going to start with a lady who is 65 years old, who I saw in 2010 for a second opinion. She'd been seeing her primary doctor for many years, and then all of a sudden he found left bundle branch block on her EKG. Well, he figured that was a good reason to refer her to a cardiologist. He didn't know why she developed left bundle branch block. Perhaps it was rate dependent. Perhaps her old EKGs had a slow rate. And perhaps this one had a faster rate. It was rate dependent. Who knows? But anyways, the first time it was picked up, she was referred to actually an interventional cardiologist. Um, we feel that there should be four non-invasive cardiologists to every interventional cardiologist, and that the non-invasive cardiologist should sort of triage patients, and then when appropriate, refer them to a surgeon or refer them to an interventional cardiologist. 
But if there's an interventional cardiologist who stands alone and isn't part of a network and isn't part of a group that has non-invasive cardiologists, then he's going to have to actually throw the football and then go catch it himself. So some cardiac surgeons, when they're not part of a group, have to do that. And so they advertise themselves as being cardiovascular disease, and they're trying to screen patients to find patients to do surgery on or do the intervention on. And so he, found, he saw this patient that came to the office, and so the usual response has been exercise spec scanning. But in this case, as a advanced cardiac imaging cardiologist, exercise spec scanning is not appropriate because you don't want to do an exercise test or even increase the heart rate with dobutamine as a pharmacological test or anything that's going to increase the heart rate because that will cause more perfusion decrease in the septum, which occurs naturally with left bundle branch block. And so you're going to exaggerate that. And so patients with left bundle normally have a perfusion defect, either fixed or reversible or flipped, where it's actually seen during stress and not during, uh, during rest but not in stress, they will have a perfusion defect automatically. And so that uh, basically comes with the territory. And so the best test to do is Persantin because it only increases the heart rate five beats per minute. If you do Lexascan, it will increase the heart rate on average of 21 beats per minute. Dobutamine, you go to maximal heart rate, or an exercise, you go to maximal heart rate. So he actually did the wrong test. Of course, you know I don't like spec scans because of 40% false positive, 65% false negative. But anyway, let's look at the results. And it's interesting to also know that this patient had bilateral breast prosthesis. So that ordinarily will give you a fixed anterior wall defect. It'll probably be apical too. And so if the patient has an anterior apical defect and it's fixed, okay, you know, that's going to be because of bilateral breast prosthesis. And so the patient was found to have a fixed anterior apical defect. Surprise, surprise. And then some reverse distribution of the septum because of left bundle branch block. No surprise there. So then cardiac cath was recommended for reasons that basically are false positives and artifact. Patient refused, smart lady, and decided to seek a second opinion. So she did have some chest discomfort with exertion. Now we're getting to the history instead of the EKG and denied any shortness of breath or any other symptoms. So let's see what else was going on with her. Well, left bundle branch block on the EKG, told you that. Coronary CT calcium scoring. So that was the next thing that was done. Someone did coronary CT calcium scoring. Not sure why, but let's take a look at that because we have that study. Hang on, please. So let's take a minute and see what calcium scoring really is. And so we have a color-coded image. That calcium is coated pink, so you see the spine and the sternum is pink. It's a non-contrast study, so we don't see any contrast in the arteries. And then we see calcium. Calcium. So how do we do that? That's going to be this pink stuff. And here's a little piece of calcium right there. So that would be supple perforator of the LAD. So here's something you learned, is that you got to know the anatomy if you're going to calcium score. So we basically looked at LAD, and we came over here and push the button for LAD, and then we circled it, uh, and apparently it's sub-threshold. I see a little bit of pink there, but it's sub-threshold, and it's not going to score. So let's go to the next slice. So we go slice by slice. And you have to know the anatomy to be able to do this. So you can see how someone on one of our previous conferences circled some histoplasmosis that was in the lung in the hilum. And so big chunk of calcium here, so we're going to score that. And we're already at an Agustin score of 124. Our different method is the volume, which is 114. Agustin is the South Beach doctor in Miami in South Beach who wrote the South Beach diet. 
and also did the Agustin score. So it looks like we've got 218, and we don't have anything on the right. Looks like the end of the line on coronary calcium scoring on this patient. We should be able to see atherosclerosis, and here's some atherosclerosis in the descending aorta. So that's a manifestation of aortic atherosclerosis. There it is there. And no calcium anywhere else. That's it. Here's some hilar node. This is some calcification in the hilum. That doesn't count because it's not in a coronary. So you got to know where the coronaries come off, and you got to be able to score them. And you've got to have it gated so you don't score the same coronary twice as it moves through the field. There's a little piece of calcium over there, but that won't score. That's in the aorta. Here's the origin of the right coronary. So you can see how calcium scoring is done. So we got 218 on the calcium score. But let's take a look at this image a little better. Let's go over here. Halloween view. And here's the coronary calcium. Right there in the middle, that's in the LED. Why don't we try magnifying that, making it super big. And you know me, I'm always coming up with, for some reasons, fish analogies. And so this one looks like a sailfish or a marlin. You see it's got this uh, dorsal fin, and here's a ventral fin. Here's some tail fins, and there's a beak coming out like a swordfish or like a marlin or a, certainly a billfish. So I'll call this the sailfish sign, just for fun. And so what's really interesting is the extent of this calcification, because as you see, a coronary is tubular, and so this is nice and tubular along here, like a coronary artery, but then it gets here, and the ventral fin goes way up, and you can see it's really up in here. Now there probably is some blooming artifact that occurs as a product of being a CT scanner. And so there's going to be some exaggeration of this calcification. But look, it's going way up in here. And then we come down here and we got calcium that's dipping all the way down in here. As we move that around, it's coming all the way down there, coming all the way down there. It's coming across here, across here. So this is extensive calcification that's extreme it's exceeding the boundary of a coronary artery. In computational fluid dynamics, we're always talking about boundaries, and we define boundaries before we do anything. And so defining this boundary, this coronary calcification has gone way beyond the boundaries of what you would expect for someone who has coronary artery disease with calcium and the left anterior descending. So that's very interesting. So let's keep that in mind as we move along here. And so we got almost what they got. They got 214, we got 218. So that shows you how reproducible that is. Actually, that's uh, an exposure of probably about two millisieverts. Well, if you did three millisieverts, you would have got a coronary CTA with contrast. So we really didn't save a lot of radiation and calcium score. And what do we come out with? We come out, do we know if there's any blockage? Well, no. Do we know if there's a probability of there being coronary artery disease? Yeah, the probability has dramatically gone up. This is pretty high, but it's one place in one clump. And that's very unusual because coronary artery disease is usually sort of scattered around. And so that's kind of strange also to have one big clump of calcium and we classify that one clump. So I'm not really sure what we found out by doing a calcium score. We really helped this lady or not, especially for another millisievert, we could have done a coronary CTA, and probably for less than that in the future, as we get uh, model-based iterative reconstruction, where we can actually measure the coronary CT and make a good one for the same radiation price as doing two chest X-rays.
There was an echocardiogram. The echocardiogram showed what you always see with left bundle, or you see sometimes, not always. You see frequently with left bundle is abnormal septal motion. Septal is usually, septum is depolarized from left to right. With left bundle, it's depolarized from right to left. With right bundle, it's still depolarized from left to right. So you have a little Q wave in 1 and L normally, but with left bundle, you have no Q wave in 1 and L, and you don't have a Q wave in V5 and V6. And so all that is part of the left bundle normally depolarizing from left to right and now depolarizing the opposite from right to left. And then uh, this is the exercise spec scan that the patient had. Bilateral breast prosthesis producing an anterior apical defect. And uh, also with left bundle branch block. And then with left bundle branch block with exercise, which is a no-no, which more exaggerates perfusion defects that are normally present with left bundle and the septum anyway without coronary artery disease. So history, left bundle branch block, seems to be a recent onset, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, chest trauma in 2009. Hmm, that changes the formula a little bit because with chest trauma, you can actually get damage to valves. You can have airbag deployment, which can damage the aortic valve, mitral valve, tricuspid valve. You can get damage to the septum you could get left bundle branch block from chest trauma. So that changes everything. From fever, don't know if she has rheumatoid or rheumatic heart disease because they had an echo that didn't seem to indicate rheumatic heart disease. There's some mild aortic sclerosis. Trace AR, well trace AR is abnormal. You usually have trace MR, trace TR, trace PR. You don't get trace AR. So trace AR could be a manifestation of previous rheumatic heart disease. And so tubal ligation, okay, that makes it, we don't have to worry as much about the radiation, but I, I think she's um, menopause, post-menopause. Mother had coronary artery disease. There's a family history. Don't know the age. These are the medications she's taking, and there's some allergies. Her physical examination, essentially didn't show anything. There should be some abnormality of the splitting of the second heart sound. There would be paradoxical splitting. You can hear that easily. You can hear the second heart sound on inspiration coming together, which is the opposite of what it should do, on an expiration separating apart. So it's totally the reverse of what you should hear, and you can hear that commonly. What to do next? Well, Pooh, would you like to say something about this? Do you think this patient has left bundle branch block because of coronary artery disease? I mean, she does have CAD. We saw that LAD calcium, whether that's responsible in it for the left bundle because we were just talking, right? It needs supply from both right and left, and we didn't see too much calcium in the right side. Uh, with the other left hand here, possibly could have gone uh, away from the left bundle. Uh, so either CTTA or stress CMR. Uh, kind of okay. Well, we've got a what we think is a false positive spec scan because of breast prosthesis and also because of left bundle branch block. So we propose to do a PET scan which basically trumps the spec scan. Spec scan, as you know, is a 40% false positive for whatever reason and 65% false negative for whatever reason. 47 hospitals in Michigan studied by Blue Cross Blue Shield. So the PET scan is much more sensitive and much more specific and doesn't have those false positives. The spec scan, the PET scan is either normal or abnormal. The spec scan is abnormal, probably abnormal, possibly abnormal, normal, probably normal, and possibly normal. That's six buckets. Six buckets is very difficult to deal with when we want a binary answer. We want to know yes or no, 
if the patient has coronary artery disease. We're getting a sextonary answer rather than a binary answer. And so we're kind of stuck. So let's go for a binary answer and let's do a PET scan. Well, what's the difference in radiation? Well, she's already had 18 to 22 millisieverts from her spec scan. She got two millisieverts from her calcium score. A PET scan is 3.5 millisieverts using rubidium. So that's not bad. So we're being pretty good about ALARA, the lowest radiation. Other folks aren't being so good because you could have gotten a CTA for about three millisieverts or less and you paid two millisieverts and got just a calcium score, which still didn't tell us if she had coronary artery disease. We're just dealing in probabilities. Then we got a spec scan, which all bets were off. So let's take a look at our PET scan and see if we're doing something reasonable. And well, first we have an EKG. So Pooh, why don't you tell us about the EKG before we move on? It's sinus. Um, there's a left bundle that we see um, with like RS pattern and discordant ST segments. Other than that, there could be some left atrial enlargement. V1, it's P wave. At least one of them looks inverted, but then others not as much. Um, access is leftward. Um, and yeah, that's okay. So Pooh's got us uh, here with a, a left bundle, which means that the septum will not be depolarized from left to right, but will go from right to left. So if we're looking uh, from V5 and V6, we should, uh, if it's polarized from or depolarized from left to right, you'd see a small Q wave because that's the initial forces, and there are no small Q waves. So it's being depolarized from right to left. Wrong direction, so that happens with the left bundle. So that settles that abnormal initial forces. And so here we go, QRS duration looks like at least 120 milliseconds or more. And of course the axis is leftward. And so very interesting. So let's go on and see what else we find here. So we've confirmed the left bundle. We also see she has a slow heart rate. We got one, two, three, four, five. So we got a heart rate of 60. And so that's nice. If we want to do a CT scan in the future, we got a slow heart rate. We're going to do our PET scan and we're going to use Persantin. And that increases the heart rate on average of five beats per minute. She'll go to 65 at the most. And so that's not bad. And so we're not going to see a lot of perfusion defects because of left bundle and increased heart rate, which you get with exercise or dobutamine. So all very good. So it's a nice setup to do our PET scan. And so here's our PET scan. And so we see on the CT, which you would have seen on our previous CT, we didn't point that out, bilateral breast prosthesis. We've got no ischemic changes uh, seen on the PET scan. Oh, that's interesting. But there is, oh, I guess that's on the EKG because it's left bundle. There's a reversible perfusion defect in the apex and anterior wall, not the septum. So this is real. This is real coronary artery disease when you get the apex because the apex has nothing to do with the left bundle. So we've got an apical reversible defect not very big. It's only 6% because it reverses from 11% to 5%. So uh, the baseline seems to be about 5% there. So it's only 6%. So it's not 10% uh, by uh, the Courage study. If it's over 10%, you might consider stenting. But this is really under 10%. It's only 6%. And it appears to be perhaps a mid-LAD because we don't have the territory of the diagonal involved, which would be anterior lateral wall. We don't have septal perforators involved, and so that would put us in the mid-LAD. Well, that's not the same place as the calcification. The calcification is actually in the septum in the area of the LAD, which is uh, towards very proximal. And so 
So would you suspect that you would have the lesion where the calcium is, Poo? You would, uh, but maybe it's calcified enough and there's not like flow limiting stenosis. It's hard to say. Okay, and actually there is really no correlation between where the calcification is and where the lesions are in cardiac CT. And so you can have heavy calcification and no lesion, and you can have light calcification or no calcification and severe stenosis. And so no correlation. So that's interesting. That means that we're looking at the calcium and saying it's increased the probability of coronary artery disease, but we're also saying that that's not where the disease is. And we could even say more. The calcification is actually the end stage of prior, probably dangerous coronaries where you have liquid lipid, and basically it moves to fibrosis and moves to calcification. So actually what we're looking at and counting, which is the coronary calcification, is really stable because the stability is established by the calcification. And statins accelerate that calcification and make that lesion stable. So we're actually finding the stable plaques and marking them and noting them and quantifying them, which is totally irrelevant. And we're trying to judge it by the company it keeps. We're saying if they're stable plaques, then they're going to be unstable plaques, which may not be a reasonable assumption. So the mid-LED reversible despec corresponds to lesion of the LED after the septal periphery and diagonal vessel. That would be a favorable finding because it would be on the area of coronary calcification, not a surprise from prior calcium CT scoring, would be if you're going to go in there and if it was a lesion in, this, in the calcium area, that would be very difficult to do angioplasty and stenting if you thought that was indicated because you've got to crack that big hunk of calcium. And so the patient could be a candidate for cardiac cath and angioplasty for different reasons, though. It has nothing to do with the SPEC scan, which was a bunch of artifacts. And so it's just from the PET scan. And if you use the COURAGE study, there's really there's no indication for coronary angioplasty and stenting. The patient hasn't been treated medically, and the perfusion defect is about 6% reversible. And so that doesn't match what we know from the COURAGE study. So, interesting. Patient was offered the choice between cardiac cath, possible angioplasty, conservative management with lifestyle modification, diet and exercise, and close follow-up. Well, she chose the latter, which is a wise choice because there really aren't any indications for her having a cardiac cath and possible angioplasty. But we said we can tell you where your blockages are, and we could, could do a cardiac CT and do that probably for somewhere in the two millisievert range, the same radiation price paid for the calcium scoring. And one-seventh of the radiation, less than, actually less than one-seventh of the radiation uh, for the SPEC scan. Uh, and uh, the same, or a little bit less than the radiation from the PET scan. So it's all relative. The lower the radiation, the more applicable the test is in a larger group of patients. And so follow-up visit, she said, yes, I'd like to know more about my blockages. Can you tell me more about those to give me peace of mind? And I said, sure, we'll do a coronary CT. Let's get that up for you. And so let's take a look at her heart. Many times you can see a lot of stuff just looking at the 3D volume rendered image. Sometimes there's artifact, sometimes there's segmentation that's not accurate. Sometimes uh, things uh, just don't look quite right. Uh, sometimes we have some gaps between the slices and we'll have misregistration because of breath hold or breathing. But looking at this, you know, we can get more interest and look closer at the LAD. So let's do that. And so let's bring this up here. And oh, we can see that calcium. Look over here. Here's a piece of the calcium 
that extends away from the LED. It's right there. Let's get this magnified for you. And there it is, a big hunk of calcium extending up right here away from the LED. And uh, presumably there's calcium. That's the dorsal fin. There would be calcium back in here, which was the tail fin of our marlin or billfish. And then down in here, there's some calcification. So it would be interesting to see that a little, in a little more detail because that's sort of uh, what we were started at, looking at, and we're interested in. So let's take a look at that, and let's get rid of some of this stuff and see what we can tell about the calcification. So we'll get rid of some of this stuff that's in the way and try to preserve. Oh, yeah, there we go. There's a big dip of calcium coming down here. There's another dip of calcium coming down here, and then that dip going up there. Let's see if we can take a little more off so we can see that better. It's a close shave along here. So you have to have a steady hand to do this. You don't have to worry about bleeding, though. That's a good thing. Take another look and uh, try to get more information here. Hard to tell. Where heart stops and begins here. But there we go. And now we're getting a clear view of this big hunk of calcium. Some calcium coming off there. Looks like some calcium sort of dribbling, dribbling down this way. See it? Some more calcium over in there. And so, and then the dorsal fin up there. So that's got a lot of distortion externally. And here's the, here's the, here's the calcium up in there. There it is. That's that another area up there. So calcium is very extensive in that vessel and uh, extends down into the septum a ways. So and then we've got this area down here that the LED sort of loses it and then comes back again. So let's study, let's take another look at that. So let's go back to our directory and let's recreate our image here. Let's go to the area of calcification and you see all that yellow which is the color-coded calcium is basically defined by yellow and it's only color coding the calcium inside the vessel it's not color coding these pieces that are sticking out here's a big piece going down into the septum there see that that's interesting that's on the septal side because here's the right ventricle so on the septal side and here's the left ventricle and here's the aortic valve so on the septal side there's a big penetrating piece of calcium we can see. And so let's go down here and see if we can find what we thought was a lesion from the PET scan in the LAD. You can see how the PET scan totally resolved the issue from the artifacts of the SPEC scan. And as we come down here, we come down to this area of severe narrowing, severely narrowed and just sort of a pinhole. And so that's the area of the LAD after the septal perforators, after the diagonal vessels, mid-LAD that's causing on the PET scan an apical reversible perfusion defect that's not associated with artifact. And so, and then it gets big again. So this is her coronary disease. Voila. We found it. So we can go look at the right.
and right looks relatively good. Go look at the circumflex. Circumflex sometimes is hard to trace here. And the right corner area is such a big vessel that we can't really give you, on this particular set of images, we can't get you a good view of that. We can take a stab at it here. And so, but we can do better if we go to the axial images. So let's go to the axial images, get away from the color coding, and we'll trace the circumflex. And so here's the origin of the LAD. Comes off here. And here's the origin of the right up here. And here's the heavy calcification in the LAD. Across there. And the circumflex is this little guy. It's a very little guy that's right there. It's the origin of the circumflex. It's a very little guy. So let's go check the right. Here's the right. Here's the right. Here's the right. Right's bifurcating. Here's the right. Here's the right. Oh, okay. So the circumflex is small because the right is big. Let's go back to our volume rendered image, flip it upside down and see if we can see the right. And so the right comes down this way, comes down here, comes down here, and the right comes all the way down here, gives off a posterior descending, and then gives off the posterior lateral branches. And so it's very definitely, see the right still coming along here, 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 and here. So it's very definitely a dominant right circulation, a very small circumflex vessel. So the right should be supplying left posterior fascicle, and the left should be supplying the right bundle and the left anterior fascicle. And so I suppose we could say that that area of calcification is actually dipping into the septum and actually reaching the left bundle and causing the left bundle branch block. So let's go back and see if that's possible from our non-three-dimensional anatomical images. We could say if you had a big hunk of calcium that uh, it could get into this anterior fascicle, which uh, here's the anterior fascicle right here, and here's the posterior. So it could get into the and could get into the left bundle. That calcium could. If the calcium dips down far enough, the calcium could could impede or cause some calcification impede the impulses in the left bundle. So even though this fascicle here is supplied by blood from the posterior descending, it could be calcification that came off that LAD into there. So it's possible that there's LAD calcification and that that is dipped into the septum to cause the left bundle. And so there's where coronary artery disease is actually causing a left bundle, but it's not a vascular supply or perfusion, it's calcification, and the calcification has extended. And so let's go on to our next case. Now we sort of got a baseline from this one, and we'll quickly talk to you about the next case, a 55-year-old male with hypertension, family history of cardiovascular disease, and came to our clinic as a new patient in 2006. His mother has severe coronary artery disease, and uh, she... Uh, basically has had stenting, and uh, she actually had a CT scan that was done in a radiology department and actually was having unstable angina during the CT scan. They give you nitroglycerin, but it is stressful to receive contrast. It doesn't carry oxygen. And so she was actually having acute coronary insufficiency, and the radiologist actually read the severe three-vessel disease as being normal coronaries in a lady who's having an infarct on the table. And so that's pretty unusual and pretty irregular. Uh, but anyway, 
that's what happened to her, and that's the mom. And so the son certainly has the history. The wife has lipoprotein little a and has severe LED disease and has had a bunch of stents. And so this gentleman is a non-smoker. He's actually an it works in the environmental business. His father also has heart disease. His father had a heart attack and died from a heart attack. So family history rules. Genes rule. So let's see what happened to him. And so physical exam was normal. He was in great shape. He exercises a lot. The question is what to do next. And he said, I don't want much radiation. He said, whatever you do, it's got to be low or no radiation. So let's see what we did do. And, well, he had a stress test, he had a, a regular stress test. And here's his resting EKG. Pooh, what do you think about his resting EKG? Sign is not too much ST segment changes that I see. Okay, so that looks pretty normal. A little bit of early repolarization, perhaps. And so here's his stress test. And over on the right, you can see his maximal ST change at exercise. And actually, it tells you what it is for you because it's got those numbers. And the numbers correspond to different intervals from the QRS. And all numbers seem to be negative in terms of 2, 3, F, V5, and V6. So it's saying that some ST segment, horizontal, decreased ST segment in the lateral leads. So, you know, it's a, it's a minimally positive test at peak exercise at uh, 13 minutes at 15.3 uh, METs. And so whatever it is, it's certainly, by the Duke score, would not be considered significant and we wouldn't have to be something that we'd have to jump on in this patient. He had no symptoms. And so he again wants low radiation or no radiation. And so he asked for a calcium score. We don't have his uh, coronary calcification information. I can show you from a later CT scan. But his calcium score was scored as 32 in the LED, 35 in the circumflex, and nothing in the right calcium score of 67, and he had some extensive calcification that was dipping down from the LAD. We'll talk some more about that. He was advised to keep a blood pressure diary. They stopped his chloride because it wasn't a good antihypertensive, switching him to an arm, and some fluctuation in his blood pressure, and we finally got it under control, and he was doing well until, and Pooh, you want to take a look at this one. So sign is um, left bundle again. Um, ST segments are even the repulse quite a bit. That is discardant ST. It's more than five millimeters. PR interval is five. Border lines getting close to being in lead, but still I think within normal. And then left road axis. So we've got another patient who has an acquired left bundle branch block. Didn't see that before when he had a slow heart rate. His heart rate is 1, 2, 3, 4. It's about 70, you know, maybe 68, 70. And so he does have a left bundle. He has abnormal septal depolarization. There is no Q in 1 or V5 and V6. So the septum is being depolarized from right to left and rather than left to right. And so the question is, why does he have this? Was it from coronary disease? Well, we know that get the left bundle from coronary disease, you got to have two vessel disease. You got to have right, severe. You got to have perhaps uh, a couple infarcts, a big infarct from the LED, a big infarct from the right. And so we don't think he has that. So that's very unlikely that this is secondary to his coronary artery disease. So he did have a Persantin PET CT scan. Why did we do Persantin? We did Persantin because it has the least increase in heart rate. Increase in heart rate with left bundle causes septal decrease perfusion. So we don't want that artifact. So we're supposed to get at the most, you know, an average 
or a mean of an increase of five beats per minute in his heart rate. He got 17 beats per minute in his heart rate. His ejection fraction increased, which is appropriate. The myocardial perfusion was normal. No great vessel calcification, but he did have some calcification this time, and a little bit on the right, it appeared. It appeared that he had a little bit on the right, too, uh, on this uh, part. And this has a CT scan associated with it for attenuation correction of basically the body habitus. And so that's interesting. So no perfusion defects. The patient did have some hypertension when he couldn't be weaned off the beta blockers. He started his own medication called natocanase. He started was started on Tecturna, Valturna from Tecturna. Every year, his EKG showed a left bundle, normal ejection fraction, normal wall motion. So he was doing fine until he showed up at the ER. And he showed up at the ER with what he thought was heartburn, chest tightness, blood pressure shot up, went back to sleep, pain went away, woke up, feeling good, then got more chest pain at breakfast time, came to the hospital with chest pain. And so his EKG showed left bundle branch block, no change. Can't usually read an infarct with an EKG, but you can at times. Abnormal septal motion, secondary left bundle branch block, distal septal apical hypokinesis. And the key here is apical. Left bundle branch block does not give apical hypokinesis. The hypokinesis is in the anterior wall and the septum. You can get paradoxical septal motion, but not apical hypokinesis. So just like the lady who had the persantin artifact with persantin PET, that wasn't an artifact, it was actual disease, decreased perfusion of the apex. And so that's not left bundle. This is not left bundle. So we think he has real coronary disease. And he went on to cardiac cath. And let me see if I can show that to you. Hang on. And uh, Pooh, would you like to tell us about his cardiac cath? Sure, yeah. Uh, so that's Ario. Actually, I live in. Uh, so there is. Proximally, uh, right after the left main, the left main shot, but right, yeah, right there is. Uh, right there is prox Yeah, prox Let's see what's going on. Yes. So, so there is. Prox And then yeah. this, this one too, yeah. So it's definitely two vessel disease, definitely LAD, slow filling, it seems like, of the LAD. It fills out slowly. Uh, can't really see the calcium. It's like somebody's in there with a wire doing an angioplasty. There's the right coronary artery. This looks pretty good. Some disease in the right. There's disease everywhere. There's some right proximal coronary disease over there. In this area here. There's some disease. And then he had angioplasty and stenting. And then his symptoms went away. And this is the right, and this is the LAD. And uh, this is uh, first marginal, and this is uh, circumflex. So he, he certainly doesn't have disease that would cause a left bundle. And in the interim, he's done well. 
he does have a high lipoprotein little a just like his wife and so he's being treated for that he had an echo and follow-up that's normal except for the left bundle giving abnormal septal motion and he had a coronary CTA and follow-up which we'll show you here's this Here's his case. Let's take a look at that. There's a stent over there. And you can see the stent. Looks like there's uh, some interruption in contrast after the stent. People get that the Tootsie Row effect and you get roll you get some stenosis proximal and it's some stenosis distal to the stent and this is the LAD stent it's, you can see the calcium that's in it also it's hard to see any calcium there is calcium coming away from the stent over in this direction it's really hard to show that to you but there is calcium coming off this area of calcification there's calcium that's coming down from it it's harder to see and so let's see how this vessel looks and then how its companion vessel looks so let's go over here look at this one And then let's go back and look at that one again. Here we go. And so this one, this looks good. We're coming down this vessel. There's the stent. There's some proximal narrowing up here. Let's see if we can show that to you better. So here is the origin of the LAD. And as we move down from the origin, make this bigger there's some proximal narrowing right in there as we move down right there and with this but it's kind of made to look more than it is because of the stent and then we look at the stent the stent looks okay and then we look on the other side of the stent and this looks okay too so there's no disease really on the other side of the stent that looks pretty good over here really there's contrast in there and so it may be that there's it looks different when we come off this direction on this vessel so it looks like successful stenting in this patient uh, who let's go up here and uh, this vessel coming off the side probably has some compromise at its origin and so it's right distal to the stent uh, there is a reduction in size right there and so that's that side branch that came off of there this is the LAD of the septal perforator and this is the branch that's coming off this way that may just maybe a giant septal perforator this is more like a diagonal vessel coming over here and this is actually an LED that's small and the small LED has compromised at its origin but the diagonal is okay so this was one of these things where you have to put a wire down both and you do a kissing balloon and we're left with the residual at the origin of the diagonal although the patient is asymptomatic at this time there is a problem there and so that's basically in summarizing, let's go back to our original slide. And so left bundle branch block is not, is not commonly caused by coronary artery disease. True. Left bundle branch block is usually an incidental finding. True. Left bundle branch block is mostly caused by fibrosis, sclerosis, or calcification. True. Left anterior fascicle receives its perfusion by a septal perforator uh, from the LED. And uh, that that's, uh, causes uh, either a right bundle or it causes left posterior uh, hemi block. 
and then the left posterior fascicle receives its perfusion from the avionova branch from the right coronary of the circumflex, depending upon if it's a dominant vessel. The largest infarcts are associated with the LAD, anterior wall, septal, apical MI, and right bundle branch block, sometimes left anterior fascicular block as well, but not left bundle branch block. And if you ablate a septal perforator ablating the septum, that does not cause left bundle branch block. It causes right bundle branch block 75% of the time. And left bundle branch block in acute MR are mutually exclusive by software programming, uh, but cannot, they're not really mutually exclusive in that you can get a left bundle and have it for a long time or develop it recently and then get coronary artery disease and an MI on top of it. And you can read sometimes, and I'll show you one day, you can read, we had a patient that had inferior wall MI with SD segment elevation that was very dramatic and very obvious, and the computer didn't read it because it's not programmed to do that. And everyone in the ER department missed it because of that. So thank you for coming today, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation on left bundle. Do you have any questions, Dr. Carroll? And no questions from Dr. Carroll. And so uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye, Pooh. Bye, Teresa. Sharon. Bye, Donna. Bye, Dr. Carroll. <laughs>